I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Roots and All podcast. This week, I'm honoured to be joined by the Queen of Containers, Harriet Rycroft. Harriet worked for many years at Witchford Pottery in Warwickshire, where she became renowned for producing season after season of the most spectacular planting and colour combinations. Since leaving Witchford, Harriet has continued to give talks on planting, and she also currently works at the Cotswold Wildlife Park. The park has just released a book titled The Cotswold Wildlife Park, a celebration of the gardens, which Harriet produced in collaboration with the park's head gardener, Tim Miles. I'll let you know how you can get hold of a copy of this book at the end of the interview, but suffice to say, it is a stunning book about this real plant connoisseur's garden. And as Harriet took most of the photos in the book, you can see how her artistic streak and eye for the aesthetic lends itself to many disciplines. There are photos in the book of many of the park's stunning container displays, which are planted in vessels of all shapes, sizes and materials. And I started off by speaking to Harriet about what makes a good container. Oh, and Harriet had the door open to her garden, so enjoy the bird song. The first thing I was thinking about when I was reading through your book was I was looking at all the different containers that you use at the wildlife park and you've got those big half barrels but you've also got some containers that are on a wall. And I think you mentioned that there's a reservoir in the bottom of those. And it got me thinking about what is a really good container to use in terms, I suppose, of size and material, and also what are really not great containers because they're such high maintenance. Anything with a drainage hole in the bottom, you can use as a container. But the key is to get, is what I call RP3, right plant, right pot, right place. So you've got to think about all those things. What are you putting in it? Where are you putting it? And there is just so many variables. This mm. is the thing. I mean, if you put a small metal container facing south, mm-hmm. that's going to get really hot in the summer because the metal will just conduct the heat straight through. And you'll find that however much you water, even if you're watering it every half an hour, which you probably will need to when it's a small container facing <laughs> south, even if you water it frequently, your roots are going to cook in there and your plant will never be happy, even if you're constantly looking after it. So you've got to think about where you put it, what the container is made of, how big the container is, the volume of it to suit the plants. I don't know, just so, so many variables. You just have to experiment and observe. This is the main thing. Observe what's happening to your plants. So for container planting, the best thing to do if you're new to it is to plant some containers and then make sure you look at them, hopefully every day. Mm -hmm. If not, at least once a week, go around and have a good look and see what's looking happy and what isn't. One of the things I've always struggled with with containers, I tend to plant them up wintertime, plant them up again in springtime plant them up again in summer and then ignore them till I clean them out. But some people seem to really get the hang of doing what I think is referred to as layer planting. Is that something that you do? Do you recommend it? Is it easy? It's not easy, but it's really satisfying. And, you know, I mean, I do hundreds of them every year. And if you get it right, it's fantastic. I'm looking at one at the moment, which is a big tub, which I did for a demonstration. And it's got four or five different kinds of tulip in it and it's got muscari in it and it had crocuses in it which have gone over and it's got some little narcissi in it as well and it's got thyme and it's got euphorbia and it's got ivy and it's got some little pansies and that's worked really well and that's from partly from years of experience and trying it and trying it and trying it and Also from making notes, I keep notebooks, which started when I was at Whitford because what used to happen was when I did the autumn planting, I'd put labels in saying how many bulbs of of which variety I'd put in, into the pots, and uh, people would pinch the labels. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) So I'd end up kind of deplanting all the things in summer and finding that 
I had no idea what all these things were. So I started writing everything down in books. And that really helps from the point of view of getting better at doing the layer planting, which is really effective if you do it in autumn. You can plant pots and they'll take you through looking good all the way to June. So my planting regime really is I do a massive planting session in autumn and a massive planting session at the beginning of the summer, late May, early June, and that's it. I do very little planting otherwise. So probably spring through to summer is about as far as you could push it with the layer planting. Autumn through to spring. Autumn through to spring. Yeah. But is it doing anything in autumn? Yeah, because you've got plants on the top. So you've got violas or pansies and and any little evergreen things. I mean, I've got quite a few little conifers that I put in, hebes, ivy, anything, basically. I mean, I, I quite often go to the local market and just have a look and see what's looking decent in autumn uh, that will be evergreen get little cheap things and i'd pot them on year after year after year just move them to different pots a very good value for money i think again that's something that catches people out especially over the winter a lot of people will buy the winter pansies and the cyclamen and they'll put them in their pots outdoors for christmas time and then they tend to just flop over can you explain what's going on there? Yeah, those little cyclamen that you can buy in uh, markets and garden centres and so on at that time of year, they don't like to freeze. They don't like to get really wet. They don't like to be really dry. They're really quite annoying little plants. Saying that, I've got two which are still flowering, but they're on my windowsill. So they've been pretty sheltered and it hasn't really been a bad winter. Mm-hmm. We've only had a little bit of snow and a, and a few hard frosts. I did put one or two in bigger pots and they died off. So you think those are really just temporary colour for the autumn. I think of those as temporary colour for the autumn. And it's a bonus if they last through. But what you can do if you're planting them in a bigger pot and you think something like that, or the ornamental cabbages are another one that will quite often die off in a, yes. a wet, cold winter. What I tend to do is when I'm planting those in a mixed planting in a big pot with lots of different plants is I'll plant crocuses really closely around them, almost pushing them into the root ball. And then by the time those are dying off, your cyclamen or your ornamental cabbage, the crocuses are coming up and then they flower and you can cut off any dead bits of floppy cyclamen or brown cabbage and the crocus will take over and then the crocus leaves will hide that little gap. That's a good tip. So... You just learn little things like that. And sometimes you do it accidentally just because you've bunged lots of stuff in a pot. I mean, I'm very much from the bung it in and see what happens school of gardening. (laughs) You've just got to try it. Yeah. And I suspect this is a bit of a question like the first one in as much as there's probably lots of different answers. But in your experience, what do you like to put in the pot in terms of growing media? Well, I've been uh, puke free for a while now. Oh, well done, Um, good. Which is great. I use Melcourt Silver Grow, which is made of wood chippings, basically. But it's the Silver Grow, they call it with added John Innes, but it's, it's got loam in it. And I do find a bit of loam in the compost, a bit of soil, helps to hold on to the nutrients. And so your plants will be happier for longer. Uh, I've never really liked using the John Innes compost. So I know they're very much recommended for plant in, in pots but I don't like them because A, they've got peat in them, the true John Innes mixes and B, because they tend to go very compacted yes, over, after a while and yeah. in the bottom, especially of a big pot, you'll find that it's got really solid at the bottom and, the, and you know, you've got to try to keep the whole of the volume of the pot a healthy place for the roots of the plant. Just use your favourite multi-purpose compost but If it doesn't have loam in it, you can just get some bagged topsoil and mix that in. And how about the age-old question of crocs? Oh, God, crocs. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Well, when I do talks, something I show people is that you only need a croc to cover the hole in the bottom of the pot. You don't need to put loads and loads of crocs in. If you have a deep layer of crocs 
what happens is that's an area of the pot that doesn't have compost in for your plants roots to use so you're making your pot effectively smaller it doesn't aid the drainage the rhs has confirmed this gardening which confirmed it ages ago i've been banging on about it for years doesn't make any difference to the drainage water doesn't drain readily from a fine mixture to a coarse mixture it just doesn't cross that boundary very well and what happens with the layer of crocs in the pots is that it makes a lovely home for things like slugs and wood lice. And when you tip your pot out, when you're ready to move your plant on to maybe to a bigger pot, all the crocs fall out, makes an almighty mess. <laughs> it rips the roots of your plant. It's just a nightmare. It's just not necessary. But if you put one croc over the hole, basically it's to stop the compost from falling out when you moving the pot about and the compost hasn't turned into a root ball. But also, when you're deplanting, when you're taking your plant out of the pot, it gives you something to push against through the drainage hole. So you can put your thumb or a trowel handle or whatever through the hole and push against it and you're likely to get the whole root ball out instead of your thumb just sinking into the compost. It does definitely help because I've, I've experimented with using things like polystyrene and stuff as well but of course your thumb just sinks into the polystyrene yeah of course yeah that's a really good point <laughs> and also in a big pot polystyrene can compress down and actually seal the hole oh, <laughs> yeah. i was caught out with that a couple of years ago my pot was full of water and couldn't understand it and um oh. it did out and it had some flat polystyrene in the bottom never thought of that I have so used it you can use polystyrene i do use it in big pots where i don't want to fill up the entire pot with compost and i'd rather i was using it in a pot than it was going into landfill or yes. being burnt or whatever but i only use it on a temporary basis you know not for something that's going to be in there for more than a well six months to a year and do you use those water retaining granules at all i would use them possibly in a hanging basket because it's so difficult to keep hanging baskets watered but i'm a bit of a skin flint with plants so I, I like to keep my plants from one ear to the other if i possibly can if i can cram them into the greenhouse and if you use those water retaining granules even if there are just a few in the root ball of your plant so you've got a nice geranium pelagonium that you want to keep well pelagoniums really hate to be wet during the winter especially if they're cool and I keep my greenhouse cool I don't keep it really warm and things like that just tend to rot if they've got right the water retaining granules in and I quite often see garden centers selling compost in the autumn which has water retaining granules or wetting agent in it as well oh that is horrible for using in the winter it makes me very cross when they do that yeah it kills your plants that's interesting so there'll be people out there who are mystified as to why their plants are dying. And quite often it's because blooming compost has got wetting agent or water retaining granules in. So you really don't want to use that stuff over winter. If I've got a container that's got something in there that's leafy and something in there that's covered in flowers, what would I be feeding that with throughout the growing season? I normally mix in some slow release fertilizer when i plant the sort of general purpose high potash kind so i mean if it's a mixed thing yeah i tend to use the potassium ones if i've got leafy plants in a pot for more than six months to a year every spring i'll give them maybe a bit of chicken manure Mm -hmm. to scrape off the top layer of compost like i've got some ferns and hostas and some shrubs and so on in pots on a fairly permanent basis and for those i'll top dress them every year i'll take as much of the top layer of compost off as i can without wrecking the roots and then i'll sprinkle in some of the pelleted chicken manure which is quite high in nitrogen so it's good for leafy growth and put fresh compost on the top and that will keep a lot of things going in the same pot for more than a year Thinking of the things that you've got in pots permanently, what are some of the things apart from the hostas and ferns that do really well in pots on a long-term basis? I mean, anything will do well in a pot on a long-term basis if it's in a big enough pot and if you feed it occasionally. What have I got that's been in pots? Where I'm just, I'm just going to step outside the door. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like a rosy uh, reporter. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've got Ribes odorata, which is a white one. I can't remember the 
it's probably uh, album. That's been in the same pot for probably 10, 12 years. It's in a quite a big pot. The pot is about 18 inches diameter. But I top dress it every year. I've got various shrubs. I've got a little bay tree. I've got conifers that have been in pots for donkey's years. Is there anything that really doesn't get on well in a pot? For some reason, pulmonarias don't seem to be happy in pots for very long. Oh, that's weird. Don't really know why. Some things that run... Like, the classic thing is for people to recommend that you grow mint in a pot to stop it running all over your garden. I think some things run because they use up the nutrients they want really quickly and need to move on somewhere else. And so things like that and Euphorbia griffithii, Dixter, they'll run to the edge of the pot and then they'll stand there all around the edge of the pot looking out and going, help, let me out. <laughs> Trying to make a bid for freedom. So you're just constantly having to chop those in half and repot them and fiddle about with them. Yeah. And so I get annoyed with those. So if you're like me and you aren't prepared to put too much work in or say somebody <laughs> said to me, oh, what if I've got a holiday home? What am I going to put in the containers there? And actually I do rent my place out. And so in the summer I might not be able to get here for a week to water which is a disaster yeah. for most of the stuff I've got. But if you were to not be around too much or not wanting to put the effort in, what would be a good thing to put in your containers, if anything? Well, a containers aren't really the low-maintenance option. But if, for example, you wanted something you didn't have to water all summer, then go for succulents, you know, things that like desert conditions pretty much, or at least will put up with them. And if you're looking around the garden centre, look for things that are drought tolerant. But succulents you can leave for an entire British summer without needing to water because they'll get enough rain. But most things will require at least a little bit of water, depending on how big they are. But if you're just going away temporarily, there are things, you know, there are strategies. So, for example, I mean, I've got a ridiculous number of pots, but that's just because it's me and because I've got a backyard that's very ugly without any plants in it. So I need to have lots of pots. At least mm -hmm. that's what I tell my husband. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's your excuse and you're sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> but I have learned over the years that plants will do much better if you keep the pots in groups because they shelter each other from the wind, they shelter each other from the sun, even to a certain extent from the frost in the winter. So grouping works all year round, but they definitely lose water much less quickly if they're in groups. Again, it's about getting the right plant in the right place as well. But what you can do if you're just going away temporarily and you want to give your plants the best chance of surviving, if it can be cut back without destroying it or without chopping off all the future flowers, then cut it back before you go. Because the more leaves it's got, the more water it's going to use. So I've found cutting back can really help if you're just going on holiday. The other thing is mulching. Mulching really helps, so you're not losing water from the surface of the compost. I don't always need to mulch because I tend to plant pretty densely in most of my pots anyway, so the surface of the compost tends to be covered. Mm -hmm. But if it's not covered, then mulch it with bark chips or pebbles or whatever your preferred mulch is. And move your pots to the shade because, you know, containers, they are movable. So if you're going away, it doesn't matter if they're all crammed together. Put them somewhere shady and sheltered from the wind. And the other thing is just be nice to your neighbours. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And you were talking about the wood lice and the slugs and everything that you get at the bottom of pots. Again, that's a problem that I've got in my garden they do tend to lurk under the pots, even on my gravel driveway. So what are some of the pests that you might come across with your pots? And what are some of the things that you can do about them? I've probably got two culprits mainly in mind, but you might have some more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, talking of wood lice, I get, a lot of people ask me about wood lice and ants. I get a lot of ants in the garden, but I don't get a lot in my pots. And I think it's because I keep the pots relatively well watered they don't dry out i'm not absolutely sure of that and are the ants doing anything uh, detrimental anyway no although they can kind of hollow out areas around some roots which can 
make your plants suffer a little bit, but I've never really noticed a problem with it myself. And the same with wood lice. I don't really think wood lice are causing a problem. I mean, they tend to be eating dead material. They're not really eating your live plants. No, I really don't have a problem with wood lice. But the thing that everybody asks about is vine weevils. And I do get vine weevils here. They come out of my succulents in the the spring and I can find them walking about in the house, which is really annoying. Oh, I know. They've got a bit of a (laughs) penchant for coming in the house. I don't know what that's all about. Yeah, well, they're such good climbers. They just walk. They just keep walking. Yeah, (laughs) march straight in. (laughs) They can end up anywhere. I found one on my ironing board once. Oh, for God's sake. They do get everywhere. (laughs) (laughs) I don't have too much touch wood of a problem with them in my pots because I tend not to grow the plants they like the best. They love heucheras. They love primulas. There are some succulents they really love, which upsets me because they always destroy my favourite succulents. Oh, that's got in. And strawberries, um, they're a bit fond of strawberries, aren't they? Yeah, they can be. I grew strawberries in a hanging basket last year and it was really... Really good, actually. Um, You know, I mean, obviously you don't get vast quantities, but they looked nice. They were those pink cloud strawberries. Mm. Yeah, they're lovely. And certainly vine weevil didn't seem to get to them there. But, yeah, vine weevil, again, it's down to observation. If you know what plants they're likely to get, then have a look at those and just observe them. Sedums, hylotelephium, it's called. They go for those in my pots. So... I tend to look at those and sometimes you'll find that the roots have been destroyed, but they've made you some nice cuttings on the top. You've just got (laughs) like shoots, shoots on the top with no roots. So if you're quick, you can get those in and just have more plants. But plants that are liable to get attacked by vine weevils, when I buy them, I quite often wash or compost off their roots because they're either full of vine weevil eggs or they're full of pesticide. So... I quite often wash all the compost off and just plant them almost like a bare root plant. I mean, I repot the vast majority of my plants at least once a year anyway, so they don't like that disturbance. Well, the other thing is, at this time of year and during the summer, if you've got things like, I've got some quite dense conifers and evergreens and so on, during the day, because they go marching about at night, but during the day they'll be roosting in things like that. So sometimes I'll, especially if I'm doing some repotting or planting or whatever, I'll tip the pot sideways and give the conifer a really good shake. I mean, I've got a concrete yard, so it's fairly pale. So shake it and shake it, and you'll find that a couple of vine weevils will fall out, and you can step on those, and they make a lovely crunching sound. (laughs) I just log them over the fence and then they'll probably come marching back <laughs> that same really night. Hard, they're really hard to throw, actually, because they're so grippy. They, that's true, actually. <laughs> yeah, they get, especially if they're on your clothes, they won't come off for love nor money. They are yeah. horrible little things. <laughs> and they make an excellent brooch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. There was probably one more pest I was thinking about, and uh, it wasn't slugs, actually. Slugs, as a, as snails, a aphids. People oh. sometimes have trouble with aphids in pots because their plants are getting too dry, basically. Oh, okay, yeah. And aphids will go for things that are under water stress or they'll do better on things that are under water stress. Slugs and snails are quite easy because it's quite easy to find them when they're roosting, again, during the day. So if you're being very good and checking your pots at least once a week and you see slug or snail damage on, say, your hostas. If you find damage on your on the plant in a pot, it's quite often just one slug or one snail. So the slug will be roosting on the inside of the rim quite often. So if you just run your finger around the inside of the rim of the pot, then you can find the, the, the snail on the inside of the rim. Whereas the slug's favourite roosting spot is under the pot in the drainage hole. So quite often I can be found just tipping my pot slightly and and running my hand underneath the the pot. And I've got a lot less squeamish about picking slugs up. You must be like Muscles McGee, the amount you throw your pots around. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's no well, mean yeah, feat. Considering a lot of them Potter. are heavy terracotta ones. Yeah, yeah I, I do. I have the dodgy back to show for it. Oh yeah, yeah I bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not for everyone, is it? This container planting <laughs> game. No, I mean, you know, I've got about 300 on the go at the moment oh which God. is far too many it's a lot yeah. and yes and yet i keep acquiring more <laughs> yeah it's I a don't, terrible addiction i was gonna say i didn't like to mention the addiction word but i think <laughs> <laughs> there might be like a, a container planters anonymous <laughs> springing up <laughs> in your vicinity oh uh, one more thing with slugs and snails particularly is if you've got plastic pots or pots with rims that curl over right just run your finger around underneath the rim there because the the snails will congregate in there right so, so and then you can do what you like with them you basically. can lob them over to the neighbors or yeah i tend to take mine to to retire on the compost heap so they yeah i take mine for a little walk just down the lane it's it's fine <laughs> <laughs> they're all right <laughs> no I, I it, gives, you, it gives a hedgehog something to eat exactly exactly i'm doing my bit for hedgehogs actually what i was thinking of the one that i have the most problem with particularly with bulbs is our delightful squirrel friends oh god squirrels yes our squirrels haven't got quite brave enough to come up to the house yet which is where most of the bulbs are planted we do have mice which come and get the bulbs if i'm not careful and i find with both squirrels and mice the best barrier over your bulbs is a good layer of grit or even pebbles actually if you've got super strong mice which we seem to get this year I kind of went up the gauges of gravel because there was one particular mouse, I think, that seemed to be getting it, – it found my crocuses. Yeah. And uh, it burrowed through a little bit of grit I'd, scr- I'd put on. So then I put more grit and it slowed down a bit, but it was still doing it. So then I put bigger pebbles and that stopped it. Until it gets strong again, so, so it does a bit of weightlifting. I mean, it, it's a bit like um, when you're – trying to discourage burglars you know you've just got to make it harder for them to get to your valuable crocuses so they're more likely to be disturbed or eaten by predators hopefully that's a really good tip actually i've tried putting chicken wire over the container which did work but i packed my bulbs really in, in tightly and some of them got a little bit kind of crumpled because they couldn't get yeah. their way out through the wire so it wasn't foolproof by yes yeah, so you end up with diced tulips yeah it wasn't ideal, but that's a really good tip. I shall try that. But the, the plants will come out quite easily through pebbles that are mm. about an inch in diameter even. The layer of gravel or grit's got to be about, well, an inch deep, really. And that might even got... help with the slugs, but you never know, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, it helps with slugs too. This is my final question, I think. What are some of your favourite ever planting combinations especially when you've worked in public gardens what are guaranteed to just draw gasps of amazement from visitors it's difficult it changes all the time some plants that you think won't get any attention suddenly is it's like the plant of the year and other things you can be massively pleased with and nobody seems to notice (laughs) but there are certain plants which are quite reliable for getting a good reaction Aonia marbureum svartkop, the big black succulent, people always want to know what that is. And that is a plant that is really useful because you can combine it with all sorts of things. Aeoniums, they don't seem to mind being watered along with all the normal summer plants that you would put in a container, things like, oh, I don't know, salvias and all the bedding plants. So they make a really good, strong rosette that anchors your planting and stops it from being too fluffy. So strong looking plants like that are really helpful to stop your planting from just being a a big fluffy blob, Mm -hmm. you know. Things like Rhysinus New Zealand purple with its big purple leaves, that's very striking. Mm -hmm. Things with, with big, strong looking, bold leaves. The fun bit about container gardening is that you can indulge your whims and your moods Because it's temporary gardening, basically. Most of it is temporary. Yes, most of your container planting is temporary, so go for it. Have some fun this year. It's the perfect place to experiment, and as Adrian said in our episode on daffodils, it's a brilliant way to trial things before you let them loose in your gardens. 
One thing we didn't talk about was growing edibles in containers. And as that's a topic all on its own, I thought I'd dedicate an episode to just that in the future. And if you'd like to get hold of Harriet's book, The Cotswold Wildlife Park, A Celebration of the Gardens, you can purchase it directly from the park's website, which is cotswoldwildlifepark.co.uk. Or you can buy it from the park in person. But be warned, once you've seen the book, I can pretty much guarantee you'll want to visit the park in person. Because although it's primarily a wildlife park, the gardens are phenomenal and they contain as wide a range and as interesting plants as you'd find in a garden that's open to visitors solely for horticultural interest, if not more so. So do check it out. If you'd like to reach out to Harriet or to book her as a speaker, you'll find her contact details in the show notes. So thanks to Harriet and thanks for listening. And I'll catch you next Tuesday when, due to Easter scheduling, there will be an episode out of some sort. I'm just not sure what sort it'll be. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All. <laughs>